Praise be Jesus Christ. Um, I'd like to start this lesson um, with the student prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, which is found in the Oratory Place of Prayer prayer book. This is on page 37. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, an obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give me a keen understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'd like to uh, just reflect this, uh, this gospel today, uh, or this lesson today is on the Lamb of God, um, especially taking from the words of St. John the Baptist. So if we can look at uh, John uh, chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, the gospel reads, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I did not know him. But the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. So we look at this um, right before when we look at, this is verses starting in verse 29 and ending at 34. What we see right before verse uh, 29 is that John is actually speaking to the priest um, that have been sent by the Pharisees. So John was um, baptizing, and why did he go out baptizing? He says very clearly in this gospel that the Father, the one who sent him, God the Father had sent him out and, and said to baptize, and that the one that he saw, um, that, that he would know that it would be the Messiah. Um, and so with all this commotion going on with John out into the desert, baptizing sinners, bringing people back to repentance of sin, uh, there's a lot of activity going on. And the Pharisees send some of the priests out there to find out what's going on. And so this is, this is the dialogue. This is at the end of that dialogue. And he says very clearly, uh, because they ask him uh, before this gospel, they ask him, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Who are you? And he, um, and he says, of course, that I am not worthy to even um, untie his sandal, the one that is coming. And then he points to Jesus and he says, behold the Lamb of God. He's saying this uh, you know, to the priest, to the people that have come out and investigating uh, the situation. And this would have meant a lot because Isaiah's prophecy um, prophesizes that they're actually, um, let's go ahead and read from Isaiah. But through Isaiah's prophecy, we understand that the Lamb of God will actually be a man. It won't be an animal. Um, at this time, the, the Jewish people would have been sacrificing an unblemished lamb every morning and every night for to atone for the people's sin. Now this lamb would have been given by a human. It would have been given by a man to the temple, to the priest, to sacrifice. A sacrifice of man for man. And this sacrifice had to take place perpetually. Okay, that's important that this was offered by man and it was for man. Now, what makes, what makes the Lamb of God different than the Lamb of men? What makes the Lamb of God different is this unblemished Lamb, the Lamb of God, is completely perfect. Why? Because this Lamb is given by God for the atonement of all sins. Because God is perfect, because God is eternal, um, then this, God is infinite, because of this, um, it atones for, for all sins. And there's only the necessary of this giving of this lamb once and the sacrifice of this lamb once. So when we read Isaiah, uh, this is um, 
Isaiah 52. It says, See, my servant shall prosper, he shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Yet it was, yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our suffering that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. So Jesus is the Lamb of God that is led to the slaughter, and he opens not his mouth. Um, it's very clear then that these priests, remember these are priests that would have been very familiar with the sacrifice of the lambs. They would have understood very clearly what the lamb uh, purpose was, the sacrifice of the lamb, the atonement of sin, and the fact that the Lamb of God would be a person. Well, now John the Baptist, who is a prophet, is pointing and saying, behold, pointing right to Jesus, saying, behold, there is the Lamb of God. Here's the Lamb of God. So that's real important when we see that because of who he's speaking to and who he's speaking of. He's speaking to the priest and he's speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, right at the end of this gospel, just to put all this in context, right at the end of this gospel, um, in the very next verse, which we didn't read here, he's going to speak to his disciples directly, the people that are actually following John the Baptist. John the Baptist will speak to his disciples. And again, he says the same thing. Behold the Lamb of God. This is also said to us at every Mass. At every Mass, we say, the priest says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, we also say this at the Mass during the Gloria. We say it during the Agnus Dei. We praise Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who has taken away the sins of the world. We give him glory because he has taken away the sins of the world. He has atoned for our sins. He is the final sacrifice. And so part of this lesson, we'll really talk about that and thanksgiving for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and what that phrase means and, and really what he does for us as the Lamb of God. So I want to go ahead and focus mainly on, um, on, that, one, on that one phrase, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, before we go any further, let's just talk about this, the sin of the world. What does that mean? And uh, if you've watched the other uh, videos in this series called um, uh, Good, True, and Beautiful, um, then if you've seen that, that lesson, we talk a lot about what sin is. And with this, when we talk about the sin of the world, what exactly does that mean? What is the sin of the world? And this is very clearly, you know, John talks about this. If you want to look up 1 John 2, 15 through 17, he talks about our personal sins that we have. <clears throat> we each have personal sins, and this is sins of the world. But we also have what's called original sin, which is the sin um, that we have in the world, um, the tendency to sin because of Adam and Eve. So we have two kinds of sins here, the original sin um, and, then, and then the personal sins. Jesus Christ takes away all of those, right? He takes away all those. He, he, he is the sacrifice, and, and through his sacrifice, we have the mercy given in order to expiate all sin, the sin of the world. But what does the world, this is a good question to start off with, what does the world say about sin? If we were to ask people, you know, just randomly, um, you know, what do you think sin is? Well, the fact is they may not think about sin at all. They may, they may uh, just try to dismiss it. Maybe they'd rather not think about sin. It's not worth their time to think about. And, uh, and I, I believe it was Pope Paul VI that said the greatest sin of the century, he was speaking about the 19... Hundreds, um, the greatest sin of the century was the loss of the sense of sin. And we have definitely brought this into our century 
um, you know, only being a, a, just a decade into our century, um, do we, have we lost the sense of sin? Do we even believe that sin um, exists? Now think about this for a second. If we do away with sin, okay, sin, remember, is an offense against God. It's a deprivation of what is good. An offense against God, a deprivation of what is good, it's to miss the mark. Um, when we think about those definitions, if it's offense against God, in our modern society, many people don't believe in God. So how can you offend what you don't believe? One of the reasons why we don't take sin seriously in our culture is because if sin is an offense against God, which it is, and we don't believe in God, then we can't offend anybody we don't believe in. So because of atheism and an atheistic culture, we have then um, pushed sin as not being a reality. The other thing is, if, if sin is a deprivation of good, through relativism, we can determine what good is. Good no longer is an objective, absolute reality. In fact, what good becomes is just actually whatever I think as the subject, I think it is. So how can you really say anything is a sin if everyone is determining what good is, then because good is determined by the individual, therefore a deprivation of good would also be determined by the individual. So you can see through relativism, also through atheism, that it's very easy to eliminate sin in our country in our in our country and in our world. So what happens if we eliminate the sin of the world? We can't eliminate the sin of the world, but if we believe that there is no sin. Well, what does Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, do? What is the mission of Jesus Christ? The mission of Jesus Christ is to take away the sin of the world. Well, if I say there is no sin in the world, there is no such thing as sin. Well, guess what? If there is no such thing as sin, I don't need you to take anything away because there's nothing there. Therefore, I don't need Jesus Christ. And this is very much what we have in our world, is there is not a need for Jesus Christ because there is not an understanding of the reality of sin. Not only sin in the sense of the big picture, original sin, fallen humanity. There are many people that believe that humanity is not fallen, that we don't struggle, um, that we are maybe perfect or could be perfect and, and just on our human nature alone. So we talk about atheism. We talk about relativism. We also talk about humanism, the fact that I can do it on my own, that, 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 that we're not fallen at all. So not only is there a denial of the fact that, that humanity is fallen, but also there's a denial of personal sin. So if, if, if humanity is not sinful in general, and if humanity is not sinful on a personal level, then there's no need to take away that sin. So we can see very readily why, why is there a world that is um, not needing Jesus Christ? Why is there a world that's not interested? For instance, when you say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, why isn't the world impressed? When people go to Mass and say, the priest says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Are we saying the Gloria? Are we saying the Agnus Dei? We chant, you know, praise you, Lord Jesus, you take away the sins of the world. You know, behold, you know, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We should do that with praise and thanksgiving. Why? Because Jesus Christ has taken away our personal sin. He has also been able to take away those effects, right, of original sin and give us so much more in their place and that's our hope. So we're going to talk now about what exactly it is that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, does to, um, in regards to original sin and also in regards to personal sin. So we'll go ahead and start just all the way at the beginning. We're going to start with Adam and Eve. And, and what, it, what is it that Adam and Eve had? In other words... God wanted to give them, all of humanity, they are our parents. The church teaches that there are two parents, Adam and Eve, okay, that, that are actually the beginning of, of all of humanity. And so what is it that God, in his love, wanted to give all of humanity? Well, to our body, because we're both body and soul, he gives immortality. We will never die. Our body will not suffer corruption in the grave. 
To our soul, he gives two things. He gives what's called integrity. Okay, this really affects um, when we say about, um, you know, acting correctly. This has to do with how we act and the fact that our actions are pure. Our actions are pure, our actions are holy, and they don't have any battle with maybe our desires or our appetites, but that they're all directed towards God. They're all integrated, and that's why we used to use the word uh, integrity, because there's no discord between really God's will, and this really affects our will. There's no uh, separation or uh, diversity between God's will and our will. They're one, they're integrated. Okay, so we can act correctly, but also the thing is that we can think correctly. This has to do with our knowledge. That we are given an infused knowledge, um, and this actually has to do with the fact that, that we can reason. So we think well, and we act well. Our wills are, are in union with God's, and, and, our, and our ability to think is, is more like as God thinks. This was given to our body and our soul. This was not just given to us. Our Heavenly Father did not want to just give these gifts to us, humans, but He also gave these gifts to the angels. So the question may come up, well, if we had these gifts, um, if we had these gifts, how is it possible to sin? Well, it's still possible to sin because we still have free will. We still have the choice. If you look at the angels, the angels still have integrity and knowledge. They still had integrity and knowledge, but they still had the ability to, to sin. And, and, and where that comes in is they choose that I don't want this. I rebel. I will not serve your plan, God. In other words, this is the gift, and I don't want it. I don't want the gift that you're giving me. So, of course, Lucifer, the angel of light, rebels. God, I do not want this gift. I rebel against this gift. I can handle things on my own. I don't need any gifts from you. Okay? And when he falls, then this, this, these gifts, of course, are also offered to Adam and Eve. But Satan is already there tempting them to, to also um, deny these gifts. So what happens is these gifts should have been passed on to all humanity. We can think of it this way. God wanted to give these gifts, okay, of immortality, integrity, and this infused knowledge. His desire was to give these gifts from him, the creator, to all of creation. And so he wanted to give these to humanity. He gave them to Adam and Eve as our parents as kind of custodians, in a sense. They were to have custody of these and pass these on. Because that's the way God works. He, he wants to hold them responsible to pass these gifts on. Now, did they pass them on? They did not pass these on. So I want to give you an analogy, and maybe this will help a little bit. You know, um, let's just say that there is a, uh, a grandfather that gives his grandkids um, an inheritance of some sort. So maybe he gives them land. Um, he gives, uh, you know, maybe each grandkid, you know, there's three grandkids. He gives each grandkid 10 acres of land. So 30 acres in his estate. And the grandfather says um, to his son, the, the grandkid's father, he says, I want to give your children, my grandchildren, uh, land as their inheritance. So what he has done, the grandfather has given this to the father and said, I want you, you're the custodian, I want you to pass this on. Okay? So let's say that the father um, agrees to this. Yes, okay. Um, I will do that. I will pass this gift on. But let's say that the father um, gets into a, a gambling addiction or he gets into some trouble. And he actually, because of the uh, whatever trouble that he is in, um, he has to sell the land. He has to sell the land, and his father has already passed on. The, the grandfather has already passed on. The dad knows that the grandfather has given this not to him, but rather to him to pass on. But he's in a bind. Uh, he's gotten himself in a mess. Okay, he has sinned. And so what happens is he has to sell the land. He has to sell the gift. He has to, um, in a sense, uh, it, it does not get passed on to the children. Because the father is kind of the intermediary there between the grandfather and the, and the children, um, he does not pass it on. So, of course, the children can look back and say, ah, they can really be wounded by this and say, 
Oh, how I wish I would have got that gift. In the same way, this is a good analogy for this because God has wanted to pass on to all of his creation these gifts. But Adam and Eve, as the fathers of humanity, father and mother of humanity, have, have because of their sin, has prevented this from passing. This should have passed on to us. All of these should have passed on. But because of original sin, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, there's been a block here. Okay? And these things, which should have passed on, are now going to be blocked. They're not going to be able to be passed on to all of humanity. And this is what each human is born into. We are conceived and born into, um, basically, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much about what we, and, you know, we think sometimes, and this is also correct, that we inherit um, like a stain. We inherit, <coughs> we inherit the negative consequences. And that is all true. We do that. But think for a second, the, what the original sin does, it's not so much about um, the negative, but it's the positive that we don't get to inherit. It's about the gifts that are not passed on. So the original sin blocks the passing on of these gifts. Through original sin, we don't get what we should have gotten. Okay? So we're born into what? Instead of immortality, we see that we suffer and we die. That's what happens to our body. We get sick, we get old, we get achy, and eventually we corrupt in the grave. Okay? Um, with the integrity, what happens with our will? Is our will completely united with that of the Father? No, we, we have a, a clashing, right? And so we have what's called a weakened will. Our will is weak. We don't always act correctly. What happens about our knowledge? Well, we have what's called a darkened mind. This is ignorance. And we're ignorant about a lot of things. It takes us a while to learn things. And also, especially in our discernment of what God wants, it takes us a while to figure out what God wants. Perhaps, maybe even if we figure out what God wants, we lack the courage necessary to do it. So we can look at um, some of the virtues that help with this. Of course, prudence would help out with this. Prudence helps us to know right and wrong, to under understand that. And then courage or fortitude helps us actually to do that. Um, so we see that the virtues are given to us on a natural level. We do still have natural things that help us with this struggle. But what is this? Really, what is it that we're born into or actually conceived into? This is a struggle. As humans, all humans share this struggle, okay? Even Jesus Christ. It says, you know, Jesus Christ was like us in all things except for sin. Did Jesus Christ have to suffer? Yes. Did Jesus Christ have to die? Yes. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, enters into the struggle of humanity, okay? Did, did, with the weakening of the will, did he see people all around not understand what God, he, 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 empath, he, he can understand what we are going through because he sees this, okay? Even though he is not ignorant and even though his will is one with the Father, right? He and the Father are one. There's a union of wills there. He experiences and understands all those around them, including us, that, that, is in, that it's in this struggle, and he is in this struggle with us. Even though he is not committing the sin, he is understanding where we're at. So all of this is the human struggle that instead of these being passed on to us, this is what happens because those gifts, these gifts were not passed on, and so we, we are left with this struggle. What happens in this struggle? Well, if we return back to Adam and Eve, now we can go back and look that Jesus is the new Adam. Eve is the new Mary. Where Adam and Eve had said no, Mary and Jesus now say yes. 
Mary and Jesus are going to give us the gifts necessary to enter into this struggle and to conquer this struggle with them. And so what happens here is this is just natural. These gifts are, 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 are natural. This is natural to us. This is now natural to us, even though it's a fallen nature. This, is, this would actually be called preternatural. The, the before the fall gifts. This is um, a fallen nature. So what happens now? What's the next? Where's the hope here? In fact, why can we say this? What St. Augustine will say, O oh, happy fault of Adam. O oh, happy fault of Adam that blocked this. Why is that happy? Why aren't we mad? Why are we mad like the children that say, why didn't I get my land? Why didn't I get my inheritance? Okay, Why can we go ahead and let that go and move on? Because Jesus and Mary, and because of the yes, because now we have the before the fall, after the fall, but now we have what's called supernatural. Su supernatural, okay? More than nature. This is the order of nature, right? This is the order of grace. We were born into this struggle. How are we born into this life of grace? We are born into this life of grace through baptism. That's why it's so important when we connect this gospel reading, we see that this gospel reading is, is centered around the baptism of our Lord. And, and then in the midst of that baptism of the Lord, you know, John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, this is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. He'll take away original sin, right? By, by giving us the ability to enter into the struggle and conquer the struggle with his grace. But he'll also... He's going to conquer personal sin. And we'll show you just a second how to do that. So, this is the realm of supernatural, the order of grace, the life of grace, which we are born into by our baptism. So what does this entail? Well, suffer and die. We will still suffer. We will still die. But Jesus says that even in the midst of suffering, I have come that you may have life to the full. So even though the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, we see a lot of suffering, right? I have come that you may have life. That's why in the midst of even the deepest suffering, we see life. Even in the midst of suffering on the cross, we see life. And so we can have life, we can have hope in the midst of suffering, and we can also be assured of the resurrection, right? A weakened will. That's a struggle that we all have. To do the right thing. To do good. We look once again at our Lord. This, he says, he, he tells us to pray, Thy will be done. We pray probably daily, the Our Father, Thy will be done, Thy will be done. It's grace. Grace is the only way that that prayer can be lived. We see in the garden that Jesus says, Not, not my will, but your will be done. He understands that, 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 that conflict. He understands the, the conflict bef between our will and God's will and how there's that battle, that struggle to make our will and God's will one will. One, un un the union of wills, right? Um, okay, and then we look at Our Lady. And we say this in the Angelus. It's beautiful. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, and this is the key, be it done according to me, be it done to me according to thy will. Be it done to me according to thy will. The fiat. Yes, let it be done. How are we going to overcome our weakened will? By submitting to the will of God. St. Benedict in his rule of life just says it very bluntly. He says, hate your own will. Hate your own will. And we should hate our own will. When our will is connected to God's, we should love. Love it, love it, love it. But when our will is contrary to God's will, we should hate our own will. 
because we don't want anything that would be different than God's holy will. And the discernment of his will is about is, is what we do as Christians. And we, and we use these scriptures and these examples, the prayer, the life of Jesus and Mary, to accomplish that. What about the darkened minds? Let's look at two different places for that. St. Paul says, put on the mind of Christ. Okay, um, you know, trans be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So th think as Christ thinks. Put on the mind of Christ. Now, I like this uh, because St. Augustine, returning back to St. Augustine for a second, St. Augustine, when he was asked uh, about certain um, topics, he would say, they would say, St. Augustine, what do you think about this? And he would, he would reply, I think as the church thinks. And that's a beautiful, to put next to this, I think as the church thinks. Are these st statements different? Put on the mind of Christ, think as the church thinks. The church is the body of Christ. So to think as the church thinks means is equal to putting on the mind of Christ. Anytime we have a question, a moral question, a, faith, a question of anything about our life, you know, look and see, what does the church say about this? What does the church say about this? And, and the church has an answer. And now, when we do find out in this scenario, if, if there's a moral issue, let's say, and, we, and we, we look into the catechism and we say, huh, this is clearly what the church is saying about this. So we may put on the mind of Christ. We may think as the church thinks. But then the question is, now that we know the will of God in this area, do we have the courage to unite our will with His? In the midst of all of these struggles, which are very real, extremely real, and, and known to all humans, will we accept this? Because grace is what is offered to us. Okay, Grace is what is offered to us to live this life so that we can overcome these struggles, that we can overcome our fallenness. So how is Jesus Christ going to take away the sin of the world? Well, he takes away, what I mean take away original sin is what has been given to us, or actually what has not been given to us, the consequence of original sin has been now um, overcome, right? Where sin came in, grace came in all the more. Where sin entered, grace overflowed all the more. And that's what's happening. So we want to live this life, and we want to use this as the gifts, the tools to, to really um, enter into this struggle with our Lord and Our Lady. And so the last thing is, let's kind of return back and say, what has God given us? What did God give all of humanity originally? Immortality, integrity, and knowledge. Okay. What does God give us now through Jesus Christ? What does God offer each person through Jesus Christ? He offers each person life and resurrection, the ability to be holy, the ability to actually accomplish His will, and the ability to think as He thinks, to understand, right? To understand His will, at, at least what He wants us to know. We will not understand everything because we're not God, but we can um, understand what has been revealed to us. And that's the importance of divine revelation. So where does personal sin come in? Well, just like we have here, all of these gifts were not able to be transmitted, passed on because of original sin, right? All of these gifts are meant to be transmitted. We want to transmit that life of grace. We want to pass on the gifts of, of being holy, thinking well, doing well, life and resurrection. We want to pass that on to our friends. We want to pass that on to a world that does, know, does not know Jesus Christ. We want to pass that on to our children, our grandchildren, our coworkers. But what's going to keep us from passing that on? Well, what kept Adam and Eve from passing these gifts on? Sin. So it's personal sin that keeps us, keeps these gifts from not only living in our own life, but being shared with others. When we commit a mortal sin, it's like putting a wall up 
to where these cannot be transmitted into our own life. Okay, that wall goes up. When we go to confession, this wall is down. So when we say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, how does he take away personal sin? Confession. Once we go to confession, these things are transmitted now. They are able to function in our life, and they are also going to overflow and be offered and be an example to other people's lives. What happens when we commit a venial sin? Okay, well, then there's a thin line here. You could almost say like just a, a, a small little, almost like a paper towel, where the water could still come through, but it's going to go through slower, right? In other words, the grace can still be evident in our life, but a little bit slower. And then we keep adding a few more venial sins. Okay, and this grace is very, it's less evident in our life. Now, when I speak here, I'm speaking of sanctifying grace, a grace that actually comes to us from the sacraments. Um, I'm not speaking of actual grace, because actual grace is given to us um, at any time and in any condition. You know, God will still be offering us grace. He is so merciful. He is so merciful. We see that His justice happens here. His justice happens because we don't transmit the gifts that we are given. But His mercy comes in that we can say, Adam, oh happy fault, oh happy fault of Adam. You sinned, but grace came in all the more. We can also say, you know, in Thanksgiving, when we say, when we praise Jesus at the Mass, and we say, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, right? When we say that, it's, it's in Thanksgiving, because we know that He takes away this. So that we can give, we're actually, so we can be a witness of God's grace. We can be a channel of God's grace, just like Our Lady was a vessel, a channel of God's grace. Um, so let's remember that the next time, you know, just as we go to Mass and we worship our Lord, let's truly worship the Lamb of God, the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and let's pray for a world that has stopped recognizing sin. And in the fact and the reality of stop, as they stopped recognizing sin, they actually um, have no need or feel no need for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.